Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending wherever you are. Uh, let's start with another expert talk about Azure Cosmos DB, which is a, a, a NoSQL database offering available within Azure. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Marek Kamal. I'm a uh, cloud solution architect uh, responsible for data and AI. I'm working with uh, Microsoft, where actually uh, Cosmos is uh, part of my daily workload. Uh, and we'll talk about the Cosmos DB and what Cosmos DB can actually uh, bring in. So what is actually Azure Cosmos DB and what can Cosmos DB do for us? So Cosmos DB is a typical NoSQL database. So what does it actually mean, the NoSQL? Basically, uh, when you work with data and when you work with databases, the databases have several different kinds. Uh, the most common databases which uh, we have been all usually working with are relational databases, where the data has some predefined structure, predefined data types, and everything like that where the NoSQL world is actually a response to uh, modern new challenges which applications are facing globally today. Uh, one of the most uh, typical challenges which you, may, which you may face is the requirement to manage and sync the data totally around the globe. So wherever are your customers, clients, partners, players, whatever it is, you need to have the data ready for them. You need to deliver the data with extremely fast response with real-time personalization. Uh, another uh, typical phenomena is actually uh, being counted in, and it's processing and analyzing large and complex data. So it's about big data as well. And what you need to do is to scale both just not the storage, so how many data are you storing, but the throughput actually of the database. So how much of data can the database process in real time? So we'd like to offer low latency and modernize existing applications. All that can actually be provided by Cosmos DB, which is a NoSQL database, which can actually do this for you. So the NoSQL database, Cosmos DB is a fully managed database for, I would say, really modern application development with quite a lot of SLAs, which we have available for availability, for automatic scaling, for APIs, which are available within Cosmos DB, depending on the engine which you would like to use. There's several benefits. One of them is guaranteed speed at any scale. So we have a really unparalleled SLA, which is back speed and throughput. Uh, fast and uh, global for fast and global access and really instant elasticity. We will talk about it a little later. We will see actually what Cosmos DB can really offer and how you have to configure all of that. Uh, Cosmos DB can also offer quite simplified application development because we are relying on open source APIs. We have multiple SDKs uh, available for Cosmos DB development. We have uh, the availability to work with uh, something what's called schema-less data and uh, no ETL analytics over uh, the operational data. We have really unparalleled uh, business continuity and 5.9 uh, availability for the application, including enterprise-level security, which is a little complex with Cosmos DB, but still uh, quite a huge benefit uh, for the system uh, as a test. We will see in the portal how to reprovision Cosmos, how to uh, provision the individual objects uh, which are available. So uh, the main benefits for Cosmos DB uh, would be uh, would be uh, replication and uh, uh, data availability. First of all. Cosmos enables you uh, really uh, unparalleled geo-replication uh, technology where your data can be available wherever your users are. So with uh, such a global distribution, you can actually face a challenge when today's application 
are really required to be highly responsible and I would say always online uh, for achieving uh, really low latency and high availability. Now, uh, instance of any application needs to be deployed across the globe closest to the user. So when the Azure Cosmos DB uh, offers you a global distribution, uh, that's actually decide to provide low latency, elastic scalability, and throughput for well-defined semantics for the data. Uh, and you can provision the data anywhere around the world, I would say in more regions than you have ever seen with any other database. The main benefits of such global distribution, you can really build global active active applications. You can build highly responsive applications because the data is really closest to your users. You can maintain business continuity for any outage uh, happening in the region. You can scale reads and writes, so read and write operations globally based really on your needs. Uh, with uh, such scaling, there's obviously uh, quite a few challenges which are coming at the same time. So uh, one of the uh, one of the options which which is uh, uh, which is enabled is something what's called multi master write. So there is not just a database and plenty of replicas around the world, but basically we have the database around the world, and it doesn't matter where actually your clients can connect, they can connect to their closest replica, and all the data can be correctly uh, distributed uh, around the world after any changes which clients can make. So uh, this is really one of the huge benefits of Cosmos DB, which uh, I think can be as of now matched by, by any other database. Uh, we can uh, extremely fast, we can scale Cosmos DB performance. And this is very dependent on your needs. Uh, we'll talk about the performance, we'll talk about the pricing, how actually the performance for Cosmos DB is provisioned and measured. We will see what it actually means and how the system is, uh, is really working. Uh, we have really guaranteed response uh, for uh, most of the operations. The response from Cosmos DB is guaranteed to be less than 10 milliseconds, which is extremely fast database. And basically, because it's fully managed, you don't need to manage any servers, and everything is managed by Microsoft, and you don't have to work with uh, uh, any servers, any configuration, anything like that. Basically, when we're provisioning Cosmos DB, you have to make uh, several choices. And first of all, you need to choose the proper API, if you will. There are several APIs which are available with Cosmos DB deployment. Uh, the first one would be Core API or so called SQL API. This is actually the original API of a database which was called Document DB. Document DB is something like a first version of Cosmos, or in other words, Cosmos actually evolved from Document DB database, where the API from Document DB is now called core API within the Cosmos. If you are migrating from any other application, from any other open source API, like Cassandra, MongoDB, or any others, uh, any other NoSQL databases, that's obviously supported. You can, by all means. So we have actually five different APIs, uh, depending on the nature of your data which you are actually storing. So this really depends on your NoSQL deployment. If your NoSQL is oriented for a key value pair data storage, for a columnar data storage, for documents, or for graphs. So this is extremely dependent on the data which you are basically working with. Based on that, you need to make a choice. However, you have to be careful because let's go to uh, let's go to the uh, to the Azure portal. When we will check on the uh, Azure Cosmos DB, when I will create a new Cosmos DB deployment, uh, I will use a new account. 
And with the new account, which I'm just, uh, which I'm just creating, as you can see, the API has to be choosed right away. Uh, so you had five APIs available. So the core one, you have Azure Cosmos DB for Mongo, you have Cassandra, you have Azure Tables, and you have a graph database, which is called Gremlin. Uh, you cannot make a, cho uh, a change to the API afterwards. So once you provision actually a Cosmos DB account, the API is fixed. So depending on the API, if I will choose, for example, Cassandra, it will stick to the Cassandra and that, uh, that won't, uh, that won't change, uh, through the, uh, uh, through the deployment. And there is absolutely no way for you to make any modifications. The only option, you just have to create a new account, uh, with a different API if you will figure out that there is a need for uh, there is a need for uh, need for any change. Uh, what you can do right now is uh, you can some some of the services would be in the preview. Uh, you can enable notebook integration. Notebook integration actually allows you to uh, utilize notebooks for your code which you are working with uh, during the uh, Cosmos DB deployment. Uh, the notebooks are like available through numerous of the services which are available in Azure. It's not just a Cosmos DB thing. Uh, uh, the notebooks are available with uh, uh, Synapse Analytics, with Databricks, with, with plenty of other services where you need to work with uh, some level of coding. Uh, so you have a pretty nice interaction uh, between the code and the engine, which, uh, which you have, uh, which you have available. You need to choose the location for the database. There's quite a, quite a lot of locations. If you will, uh, enable notebook, uh, notebook integration, uh, the, uh, amount of available locations will decrease a little. Uh, this is due to the nature of the fact that the notebook integration is basically a preview service which is not available in all of the possible locations where you can provision the Cosmos DB account. This, however, doesn't affect the availability for the replication of the Cosmos. So still, even though you will provision the Cosmos DB in just the selected regions, you can replicate the, da the data anywhere, uh, anywhere on the world, uh, depending, uh, depending on your needs. So I'll choose uh, North Europe for my for my deployment, and here you have still uh, quite a uh, quite a uh, handful of uh, quite a handful of options uh, available. Uh, so uh, we will start with uh, we'll start with uh, a free tier discount. Uh, there is an option uh, for uh, Cosmos DB. Uh, to be used uh, as a as a free tier. Uh, with this uh, with this free tier of uh, of Cosmos, uh, you can actually use uh, the Cosmos as a part of uh, the uh, Azure free account, uh, which allows you to uh, utilize Cosmos for uh, uh, let's say a year uh, with uh, limited resources and with limited storage. However, uh, for any development purposes, you don't have to pay uh, for for the Cosmos. The service obviously is not uh, ready for free. You can choose uh, between the account types. So uh, there is a production and non-production. This doesn't change technically the features. Uh, it's just the uh, UI experience. Uh, it totally doesn't impact the uh, the runtime. It doesn't change. How Cosmos DB behaves uh, can be obviously changed uh, later on, so you can mess with uh, uh, with the setting. Uh, you can enable geo redundancy uh, if you need. Uh, can be enabled. Uh, can be enabled even uh, uh, later on. Uh, in this case, the global distribution uh, will be usually uh, done on the so-called like paired region. Always two regions 
are uh, paired together for geo redundancy. With North Europe, it would be West Europe. Uh, with uh, other regions, it's usually a region one and region two, uh, where you have uh, geo redundant options for increased high availability. The multi region rights can be enabled. Uh, by default, they are not. And you can enable also the availability zone for your database. Most of the uh, most of the settings can be changed uh, can be changed later on. So uh, when I would like to uh, create the uh, Cassandra uh, Cassandra uh, type of an account, I can just review and create, where I can go through more settings which are available uh, which are available on the top. Uh, one of them uh, is just the networking. We will talk about the networking a bit later. And the second one is about encryption. So whenever you will have any data within the Cosmos, that data will always be encrypted. That's just a choice for you. Should this then be encrypted with the service managed, managed key? So the key is managed by Microsoft. Or should this be encrypted with a customer managed key? So in that case, you need to enter the URL from the Azure Key Vault from a service where you did provision your own key, which you would like to use. So let's review and create the Cosmos DB account uh, with encryption yeah, service managed. Uh, so let's review and create again. Validation is OK. So let's create the account. It will take a couple of minutes. So I will go to uh, I will go to the Cosmos uh, Cosmos DB which I have already deployed. So there's one uh, Cosmos DB account which is already up and running. Now uh, this one account is using uh, the core API. So the uh, original one, the first one which was uh, which was developed, and that one uh, is used with uh, uh, is used with multiple databases. And multiple containers. We will talk about those a uh, uh, little later. So, depending on uh, on the API which you have chosen, you will see uh, proper settings on your Cosmos DB. However, uh, as you can see, there's absolutely no choice for you to change the API which is being used. That's sort of fixed. So, once you made a choice, the only way how to change it, although you have quite a lot of choices. You need to reprovision your Cosmos DB account again. Uh, there's quite a lot of reasons why customers uh, would choose uh, Cosmos DB. So, what, what actually uh, can make you think about Cosmos DB deployment? So, first of all, it's the first and I would say the only as of now database with global distribution turnkey capability. This means we can have data absolutely everywhere with massive speed, with extremely low latency, with extremely high SLA. You can deliver massive storage and uh, throughput scalability for the database. Cosmos DB can store quite a lot of data. I'm not saying that it's uh, uh, pretty cheap uh, with uh, storing quite large amounts of data, if we will start storing terabytes, this can be quite an expensive solution. However, we can provide a uh, single digit millisecond latency at 99% per, uh, per worldwide. This means quite a lot of requests will deliver the data within 10 milliseconds. So that's a really massive SLA. Which, uh, which you can use to your benefit for your applications. Uh, you can natively support very different types of data at massive scale, uh, both five well-defined consistency models to pick the right consistency throughput trade up. Now we'll talk about that a little later. So when you have the Cosmos, uh, Cosmos database, you can choose something what's called consistency level. There's five of the consistency levels because what you have to think about is your data is being replicated globally. And it's about the trade off between the consistency and the throughput. So, what's more important for you? If you have two clients, one in Europe, one in, let's say, Asia, uh, and they both see at any given time absolutely same records. Okay, but that will actually hinder your throughput and will require quite a lot of performance. 
would would you uh, be able to sacrifice uh, the fact that for a few milliseconds they can see different records and it will just take just a small amount of time to synchronize but the synchronization is not the key element but the speed of the response to the client would be the key element in here okay that's doable you just need to change the consistency level which you have available you can enable mission critical intelligent applications because cosmos can be integrated with plenty of other services one of the most important i would uh, i would like to pin out as definitely uh, azure synapse analytics uh, there's already an uh, uh, skill me up expert talk on uh, synapse analytics actually several of them so i would highly encourage you to go through those and just uh, and see uh, what synapse can actually bring to the cosmos db deployments as well uh, there's a, a huge flexibility to optimize speed and cost. So depending on your requirements, this, the cost can obviously vary for the Cosmos DB deployment. Uh, it's one of the databases which can be used for big data workloads. Uh, if you consider the facts, how it works, and what the trade-offs might be. Uh, it provides multi-tenancy, enterprise-grade security, naturally analytic-ready, and perfect for event-driven architectures so there's plenty of reasons why to adopt cosmos db database the turnkey global distribution as is the core of the database uh, which automatically replicates all your data around the world and across more regions than amazon web services and google cloud platform combined together action uh, so Cosmos is available in all Azure regions, provides manual and automatic failover, provides automatic and synchronous multi-region replication. So the data can be absolutely anywhere around the world, depending on where your customers are. Now, uh, you can scale the storage. So how much data are you storing within the, uh, within the Cosmos? And you can scale the throughput across the regions, even during unpredictable traffic bursts, uh, with a database which can absolutely adapt to the needs of the customers. Uh, when we talk about the scaling and the throughput, actually, what you have to think about is that the uh, Cosmos DB is scaled based on requests per second. So how many requests for the data are there each and every second? We are provisioning something what is called a request unit for such. And the request unit is basically a performance which is required to retrieve one kilobyte worth of data. So you need to put some thinking into the uh, into the query design, into the database design, uh, which will help you in estimating what the throughput actually can be. And we can scale from tens to hundreds of millions of requests per second across multiple regions. So it can totally vary depending on the need uh, of your application, on the amount of the clients within the application, on the uh, geolocation of the clients using the application, and so on. So, as I said, there's five consistency models, and the consistency models uh, provide actually the trade-off between the performance and consistency. Uh, so, either you need more consistent model or uh, you need more performant model depending on the application so you can totally uh, totally define uh, how the system uh, how the system uh, should be working so based really on on the needs of the application you can choose how the application can be uh, can be configured uh, the default consistency level is always session uh you can decrease or uh basically uh increase uh the consistency 
uh, according to uh, according to the needs. So uh, most uh, uh, performant uh, will be uh, definitely eventual. Most consistent would be strong. So uh, with strong, you have uh, uh, stronger. If you move the consistency to the left, you get uh, higher consistency. Uh, if you uh, move the workload to the right, you have uh, lower latency and higher throughput. So it's always a trade-off in these uh, distributed databases because the distribution happens across the globe and requires quite a lot of trade-offs between uh, or during uh, during the design of uh, of the application. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, guidelines how to really choose uh, the the consistency level. Uh, I would say most of the deployments of the Cosmos DB database, and that's really uh, that's really uh, verified as uh, uh, still using the uh, session consistency. So it extremely depends on the consistency or on the uh, on the usage within your application. So what the application is, uh, what the application is basically doing. So how does the resource model look like? So when we have Cosmos DB, you have seen that we have to actually create the Cosmos DB account. The Cosmos DB account is basically the primary choice where we made the uh, choice for the API. We did made a choice for the region, for the uh, Azure deployment, including the uh, uh, subscriptions and resource groups and all that stuff. So when we have the Cosmos DB account, inside of that account, we need to create one or more databases. The databases can contain multiple containers or collections uh, where the containers will contain either items or the collections can contain the documents, depending on what you're actually storing. So with containers, uh, it's something like collection, or a graph or a table with uh, container level resources. Uh, we have different items, but basically you also have programmatic objects like stored procedures, like triggers, user defined functions, and plenty of others. So let's go to the portal and let's see how this actually works. So when we have the database, as you can see, I'm running two containers within two databases. So I can create a container and the container will be placed into uh, into a, either a new database, so I can create a new one, or I can use an existing one. If I will use an existing one, I can choose one of those two databases. As you can see just right now, the uh, Cassandra uh, account was created. Uh, so it really took some considerable time. So I will create a new database, uh, this database, and we need to provision the database throughput. If I will not provision the throughput, I can actually provision the throughput for the container. So it can be provisioned either on the database level or on the container level, really up to you. So the throughput can be either auto-scaled, so we need to, uh, we need to choose you know what might be the maximum uh, 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 maximum uh, request units, or can be uh, can be manual. So we can choose how many request units would be needed, uh, the lowest possible uh, would be uh, 400 for one region. Uh, that actually gets uh, gets you a database which goes for $24 a month. However, if you will add more, as you can see, the price changes uh, basically linearly, both with linear, linear uh, pricing and linear, linear uh, uh, scaling for the database. Uh, we will see about the request units uh, right away. So I'll go into a, a sample database, which I have. In the database, I have 
four persons. Uh, the person is a record, which as you can see, is just a JSON document uh, uh, with a key value pair. Uh, so I have a first name, Eva, with some age, ID, RID, and plenty of other attributes. So when I will run a query, select just the most basic query which you can ever think of, select star from a table. So let's execute the query. It will get you four records because I have just four entries within the table. Uh, when you will just check the query statistics, uh, the output which was received as something above uh, a kilobyte, the request charge for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, command was 2.3 request units. So I just got to the database. I took one. Uh, uh, I, I just ran one single query within the database, and this query went for two and something request units. Now you have to think of the structure of your data. So how the data looks like. What the data looks like, uh, not only in terms of what are you storing, but especially what are you retrieving for the database. Uh, so if you have any data stored, are you going for the whole records? Are you choosing something selective from the database? So what would be the proper request unit size? The request unit, as I said, is measured as a work required to retrieve one kilobyte worth of data. And you need to think about, okay, so this is what one single user would retrieve. So how much of data would be required? How many users do you have? How many times per second do they run similar queries? And that actually helps you with the capacity estimation for the Cosmos DB. So there is quite a lot to think about in terms of the provisioning, because this is really not simple, how to get the proper sizing. I have another uh, collection where I have plenty of uh, JSON information about volcanoes. So let's select all the volcanoes which are, and you can just use just really basic syntax, where country equals United States. Execute the query. There's 49 volcanoes in my database. Query statistics, roughly five request units. Uh, depending on the document size, so the request charge in this case, roughly five are used. So this really varies depending on the uh, depending on the information which you're working with. So be careful about the provisioning. So again, when we'll go back and we will provision a container and a database. That's the database provision the throughput. So careful about the provisioning. Container ID. Container needs to have a name, so test container. And what you need to provide, obviously, is also partitioning key. So it's about the structure of the data which you are storing. And the partition key helps the partitioning, in other words, in replication across the storage, if you will, uh, how to actually optimally store your data through the uh, through the storage layer so it helps with the throughput quite a lot it helps with the data distribution quite a lot so this is uh, one of the very extremely uh, important facts and yet again something you cannot change afterwards so plenty of con uh, considerations uh, item ID, for example, uh, plenty of considerations which you need to take in advance. So that will create a container. Uh, and inside of the container, we can start either importing the data, creating the data, then querying the data which we will have available within 
uh, within the system. With the resource hierarchy, basically the container is a logical resource which is surfaced to, to API. However, the resources are partitioned for high availability, for consistency, for coordination across the storage pool, which is very important for us. The partitioning happens based on the partitioning key. So the partitioning is then uh, using some hashing on, on the key for physical partition sets, which distributes the data uh, over possible storage nodes, which we have available. So this is a tremendously important thing uh, to, to really think about during the design, I would say, of the tables for the, uh, for the Cosmos DB deployment. The request units, as we talked about them, are a totally abstract unit. It abstracts physical resources from the query. So you have absolutely no idea what memory, what CPU, and what IOPS are actually provisioned for your database. You just know that you are able to provision and to, to retrieve correct amount of data within allotted time. It's the key for multi-tenancy, for uh, service level agreement, for both either background and the foreground activities which you have available. With the request units, uh, you can provision the database in terms of request units per second, which will be basically used as a rate limiting. So what you have provisioned is a max request unit available. Uh, if the database and the workload will require more, which can happen by all means. It will just be queued. Uh, so there will be a like a traffic throttling or a rate limiting applied for um, for your data set. It's metered hourly. So basically all most of the background processes like explorations, index transformations, and plenty of that are scheduled when uh, uh, the replica is uh, queued. Uh, so uh, when the replica is below the minimum provision rate, uh, with uh, the provisioning, this can be changed uh, during uh, during the deployment. So what the, whatever uh, did you choose for, that can be uh, obviously obviously changed. And like with most of the services which are available within Azure you can scale basically anything what's needed. How to properly measure? You need to really analyze the query complexity. So you need to understand how the query will look like, if there will be any predicates, if there will be any functions, any indexes, uh, uh, what, will be, uh, what will be used for any query optimizations, uh, even the uh, consistency level basically has an impact on uh, on the request units which are consumed by each and individual query. So this is fairly uh, fairly complex to to do this right. Uh, what what is a huge benefit I would say is when we have provision the cosmos and you have the uh, you have the sample database or the volcano database which we have right now available. As within the database, you can uh, uh, within this data explorer, you can navigate yourself pretty easily. So the first thing is you can create new containers, new databases. You can also create new notebooks. Uh, you can work with uh, GitHub uh, connection, with terminal connection, with the workplace, and so on. So what you can do is you can create a new query. And thanks to the core which we have used, and the core here was uh, SQL core, you're just using the plain SQL capability. So you are using basically the SQL syntax to access semi-structured data or uh, uh, no SQL data, because the no SQL data is uh, based on uh, semi-structured nature. So if you will just run the select star uh, from uh, from the table, uh, we can execute the query. 
and it will get us all the records which are available. Uh, we can provide any of the filterings as you might be used from uh, the common seek language. So include, for example, the where clause. With the where clause, uh, you need to reference the table and careful, uh, the system is uh, case sensitive. So uh, with case sensitivity, uh, it will even provide you uh, uh, IntelliSense. You can execute the query, will work correctly. I would like to only have C Like to, uh, for example, get uh, uh, C type. Uh, it's actually with capital T. It has to be with capital T, and it will get you the selected uh, selected information without any problem. So let's try to get the volcano name. Let's close it. Oh, come on. That wasn't a super cool idea to have uh, the name of the attribute, uh, including the space. It's very not, not optimal, just causing some struggles. Uh, so the uh, basic SQL syntax as uh, allowing you to, to, to navigate uh, through the structure of the data uh, pretty easily. So with the structure of the data, you can select individual columns, you can select, uh, you can provide any filtering, you can even add any indexing if needed. So there's plenty of uh, options how to, how to speed up, uh, how to speed up the processing. Uh, you can uh, work with stored procedures, functions and triggers. So if you will check, for example, on the new function, uh, and we will try to create a new function, the function is basically is basically a JavaScript yeah, annotation. So nothing nothing super fancy. Uh, JavaScript uh, function needs to have a name and needs to have a body. So basic, simple programmability, which uh, which the system can actually uh, which the system can actually offer. Same for stored procedures and the triggers, which can enhance the uh, which can enhance the the options for uh for the management and for for the for the development uh what you can do as well as also to have the no notebooks as you can see the notebook can have a code which would be uh which would be basically uh which would be basically a, a python code which you can use as you can see it's python notebooks you can use the python uh you can use uh, c sharp and you can use a few more, a uh, few more uh, resources. Uh, so you can attach uh, to to any specific kernel, and uh, you can uh, uh, and you can run any of the code uh, which uh, 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 which might be needed. So basically, uh, based on uh, uh, based on your needs, you can import uh, numerous packages, create data frames. So absolutely, uh, absolutely, what you would need, uh, what would be needed for working, uh, for uh, working with the data. So uh, totally, uh, totally scalable and uh, uh, allowing you to uh, perform plenty of the operations. Now, when we are talking about the uh, global distribution, what you can do with the Cosmos is, as you can see you can configure multiple regions. So as now, I have just one single region, which is North Europe. I can add another region. You, can, you just have to search for the region. I will use the West Europe. It will be added. I will save it. It's configuring the region. It will quickly start the replication. So the two regions will be in sync. As you can see, it's now updating uh, the system. So it will replicate uh, between uh, the two regions. So the data will be uh, data will be available for both of the regions, which I had. Uh, as of now, when the changes are, um, let's say, applied to the regions, 
I cannot make any configurational changes like adding more regions, like configuring the multi-region right, like doing the failover. So you have to wait till this finishes. Takes, depending on the on the storage which is utilized, definitely. So it takes uh, 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 unpredictable time. Can guarantee that this will happen within few seconds. Uh, however, when this will be safe, and we will see that this is actually uh, this is actually finished with the region configuration, you will have a notification for that. Uh, we will see that the regions are in pair, and I can fail over uh, either automatically or uh, uh, or manually between the regions. The consistency can be set. Just change the consistency uh, and uh, uh, hit hit on save, which will change. The consistency level on your database. You have even uh, some uh, sort of a uh, infographic how the consistency might work in uh, in each consistency level, depending on how the records are actually being stored. And during the deployment, you have seen that we can configure also the networking for the customers. So either you can allow access from all the networks at the same time. So regardless where your client application customer are, they can connect to Cosmos if they have proper keys and authentication, obviously. If not, you can select either virtual networks, you can configure the firewalls, you can accept connections with, uh, from uh, uh, Within public Azure data centers, you can accept connections from uh, Azure portal, and you can even configure. Let's go all, and you can configure private endpoints. In this case, just selected services can communicate with each other. Uh, they don't even need to have a public IP address. They communicate with private IP addresses. The traffic absolutely never leaves. Microsoft Networks doesn't flow through the internet. It's always hidden inside of the Azure network. Uh, and the communication is locked down between the selected services, which you have actually choose to uh, participate in the private link itself. Now, uh, there's also an approve button, as you can see. Uh, so with private endpoint, uh, the owner of the resource has to approve the private link to actually be in place. Uh, there is also the keys for connection. Uh, by all means, you have read-write keys or a read-only key. So depending on the level of access, it's not the ideal access, but depending on the level of access, you can use proper keys for accessing uh, the Cosmos DB account. You can enrich the uh, account with adding uh, cognitive services. So for searching through the data, the cognitive service is a premier uh, artificial intelligence service which uh, Microsoft has available uh, for uh, working with uh, with the data. So you can use this for uh, searching. You can use this for recognition, for recommending, for any of the tasks which uh, you can think of. You can add Azure functions for enriching the code base functionality. Uh, depending on the programming language, it can be C sharp or JavaScript. You can be uh, can be a trigger. Do you need to uh, create uh, some uh, function app to to make this work? If you are using the core SQL, there is also advanced security, which is as of now in preview. You can turn on this on, so there will be an advanced uh, security uh, uh, threat protection enabled. So as you can see, once it's enabled, uh, it will be available for your account. So with the threat protection just turned on, uh, uh, roughly no configuration for that. Uh, all the alerts will be actually sent into Azure Security Center for your evaluation. Uh, let's check if we have the second account. This one was actually the uh, uh, Cassandra. So with Cassandra, as you can see, it's totally different. Uh, with Cassandra, basically, you don't have, for example, stuff like uh, the security. You don't have the data explorers. It's uh, it's a totally different, uh, totally different uh, interface. So uh, when we have the uh, um, uh, advanced security, this really does apply just for the core SQL. You can 
get to the document, you can get to the script, uh, plenty of other, plenty of other useful stuff, which you can actually do here. Now, let's actually go to the Cassandra one, which we did provision. As you can see, with Cassandra, we're not talking about the containers. We're not talking about the uh, uh, collections. Uh, we're talking about the tables. So with the Data Explorer in Cassandra API, you have to create a new key space. You need to uh, create the table. You need to provision the throughput, and you need to enter the command to create a specific table. That command has to be actually entered with the Cassandra query language, so with the CQL syntax, which is used for Cassandra. So each and every different API has basically different uh, has basically different uh, uh, user interface and uh, user options for yourself. There's some of the preview features which you can turn on. You need to obviously. Uh, uh, connect, so you need to know the name, the password, the ports. Again, you will have the keys available. But basically, when you are actually starting with the Cassandra, what you have to do is you need to connect to the Cassandra with the shell. So there's your key, there's your password. You need to use the C shell, Node.js, Python, up to you. What's your actually uh, delivery vehicle? So plenty of the codes available for yourself in advance. Uh, so depending on what's your uh, what's your application doing, you can choose proper uh, proper resources. Uh, if we will provision, uh, if we will provision one more, uh, as you can see, most of them are similarly uh, similar uh, to each other. Uh, so I'll do just one last uh, Cosmos DB account. Let's give me one free. And just quickly review create. Should be created. It tells you roughly six minutes, give or take. Might take some time. So this is extremely dependent on uh, on the API, what you actually can do. That API sort of locks you inside of the uh, of the of the Cosmos DB deployment. So with the syntax uh, uh, where we actually left, basically you can choose whatever you would like. You can use all the filterings. Uh, you can use all the indexes. So really, totally everything what you may be used for. Uh, with uh, with the uh, deployment security and uh, uh, the architecture, uh, what you have seen is uh, it's although it's quite simple, it's just another uh, Azure uh, first class resource which is available. It's not that easy uh, to uh, deploy the Cosmos DB due to the considerations you need to make. Uh, basically, you have to think about What's your deployment? How your data looks like? What your customers will be doing? Because that can change the deployment quite a lot. It's not just like let's create a table and let's see what what it will do. Because you can't make any modifications to plenty of the uh, of the choices you did make uh, afterwards. Within an hour, a lot of which which we had. It's uh, not that easy to, to cover all the uh, Cosmos DB features. So the main feature, it's a super fast, super scalable database used for NoSQL workloads, which can be distributed around the world, across the globe, depending on the location of your customers, clients, or applications. Uh, with Cosmos DB, you have five different APIs you can choose from. It's an ideal database used for NoSQL, big data, gaming, IoT, event-driven infrastructures, and plenty of others. So that's a brief summary of what the Cosmos DB actually can do for you. Uh, we have quite a couple of minutes left. So if you have any questions, just feel free either to ask or post a, uh, post a question into the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, it's up to you. And uh, I'll answer anything you would like.
So, if there are no questions, that's the introduction to the Cosmos DB. I would highly encourage you to try the Cosmos DB deployment and to check what the Cosmos DB can do for you. You can apply for the uh, Cosmos DB free tier, so uh, that's absolutely fine. We have absolutely no cost. So try Cosmos DB and let's explore the NoSQL world for yourself. Thanks a lot and talk to you on the next uh, Skill Me Up expert talk.